Hello and welcome to Becoming Who You Are, the guide to authentic living. My name is Hannah and I'm excited to have a very special guest on the show with me today. A few weeks ago, I had a chat with Stephanie Murphy, who runs a radio show and podcast called Pork Therapy. You can find out more about pork therapy by going to porktherapy.com, that's pork with a C, not a K, or checking out his show on iTunes. I hope you enjoy listening to our conversation as much as I enjoyed recording it. So hello, Stephanie, and welcome to the Becoming Who You Are podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to have you on the show. Thank you, Hannah. It's so nice to be here with you, and thank you for inviting me on. Um, I know we talk to each other a lot, but not, not, not too much on podcasts, but that's about to change. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, so we were going to talk today about pork therapy, which is your radio show and podcast. Um, and for anyone who hasn't heard pork therapy, do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Yeah. Pork therapy is, um, well, if you, if you want to know uh, firsthand, you can go to my website, porktherapy.com, P-O-R-C therapy.com. Um, it's been a, it started off as a podcast back in 2009. And at the time I had a co-host named Mike and we did the show together for about a year and a half. Then, um, he moved on and wanted to do some other things. And so I sort of, um, took the, the show, kept the, the name the same, but took the show and turned it into a live show with some also podcast content. And, uh, at that point it grew a lot. I think a lot of people started listening after that point, um, because a live show can reach, you know, a lot more, a lot larger audience. And so now uh, the show's on every Friday night on the Liberty Radio Network, LRN.FM, and also on the podcast over, uh, at my website. And the theme, I guess, of the show, it's pretty eclectic, but the theme that I've settled on is personal freedom and sort of how we can all feel happier and be more free in our own lives. We talk about a lot of issues related to liberty and life from um, the perspective of, a, of, of sort of the personal, you know, the things that you can actually control and think about and become aware of, and they're going to make you freer, unlike a lot of the liberty shows, which sort of focus on things that people, I don't think individuals have too much control over, like, you know, what the government's doing. And that's all very important, of mm-hmm. course, too. And, and sometimes we do talk about those, those things too on pork therapy, but I really prefer to bring something up on the show. If somebody can actually hear it and get something out of it right here, right now, uh, you know, that'll make them, uh, make them a little bit more free. That's great. And that's one of the things that I really like about pork therapy is that um, you you are part of the Free State Project and you live in New Hampshire. And there's a lot of um, politically leaning people up there. There's a lot of people who engage in activism, for example, a lot of people who do their own radio shows about politics. And what I really like about pork therapy is that you focus very much on the personal aspect. So I'm really interested in um, how you came up, what inspired you to start the show. And sort of how you kind of moved away from what a lot of other people are doing up in New Hampshire in the Free State Project and sort of carved out your own your own radio show which is very different and I think very authentic compared to uh, well not compared to other shows but very authentic for sort of the kind of person that I know you are. Well thank you so much Um, that compliment really means a lot to me because I especially right now I try really hard to be very genuine and to, you know, to be who I am on the, on the radio, uh, in real life. And I think the show has been kind of a meandering project. It didn't start off with the same goals that I have for it now. And that's okay Mm -hmm. because a, a lot of us have projects where the goals are changing and evolving as time goes on. And I, I really, I'm, I guess, going to go out on a limb and say that I don't think it was as um, authentic uh, when it first started out. Uh, basically, mm-hmm. what happened is back in like 2009, I would say, um, my friend at the time, Mike, and I were were just hanging out one day, and we were talking about I, I don't know a couple different different things, and you know we had some perspectives on maybe some conflicts, interpersonal conflicts, or some relationship issues that we saw going on around us. So we said, Hey, Mm -hmm. wouldn't it be cool to start a podcast about, um, you know, about relationships and sort of do like a relationship talk show, um, 
we didn't really want to be giving advice because we didn't really feel qualified to do that. But, um, you know, we were just going to talk about relationships and give our opinions and stuff and maybe somebody would like them. And, um, so we just recorded the first episode right then and there. And, uh, when I look back on it, I feel somewhat embarrassed about like the, the audio quality and as well as the content, because we just were not professionals. We were doing our very first podcast. Neither of us mm-hmm. had ever been in broadcasting before, so we just didn't have a clue what we were doing. But, you know, it, it was fun. I really liked doing it. I think probably because I guess I had a need to, to reach out to other people and connect with, with others and maybe be, mm-hmm. to be, to be heard, I guess, to, to have my opinions get out there and see what people thought of them and, and stuff and to give to people like, you know, if they heard an idea on the show that they liked, maybe they would try to put it in their own life and they would be happier or, or whatever. I was really into that free marketplace of ideas kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. so those things, I guess, have all sort of stayed the same, but um, you know, I, I definitely, like I said, I was embarrassed about some of the, the technical details and also the content. Cause when it started out, it really had more of like a comedy twist to it. And it, mm. I think personally in my own life, I was a lot, you know, I was a little more like disconnected, um, from my true self and from my feelings and needs and so forth. I hadn't really done too much in the way of like self work or anything like that at that point, but I wanted to have a show. And, um, you know, it, it's good to have those, those old episodes to look back on it and see what I would have said, uh, you know, in, at that time. But, um, since then I've, I think I've changed quite a bit and that is reflected in, in the content now. Um, right. yeah. So what else about pork therapy when it started out? I, we didn't have a lot of listeners and we would always like, we would make a lot of jokes about it. Like we would deprecate ourselves. It was self-deprecating humor. You know, like mm-hmm. we'd talk about how we only had like, a, you know, two listeners or whatever, and one follower on Twitter <laughs> and it was, uh, it was Mike or, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and, um, you know, that can be a little funny sometimes, but we, we definitely maybe overplayed that a little bit. Uh, there were some times when we had like a little bit crude language. And then, uh, at a point we decided to make the show quote, you know, more clean so that it would reach a wider audience. And mm-hmm. I, I felt, uh, you know, better about that, but, but still I felt like it could, it could be improved. And so, you know, at the time, um, Mike, there's a bonus episode of pork therapy on, uh, on my website, which you can find by clicking on like the bonus shows tab or something at the top of the page, um, where Mike like reappeared about, you know, a little more than six months after leaving the show and I had been doing the show on my own. And we had a conversation about things that were going on in his life and, uh, like where, where he was at. And I think it's a great show. I recommend it if anybody wants to hear that. Mm, I agree with that, by the way, I've listened to it and I think it's really interesting and really, really fascinating to listen to. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, we we had quite a, an intense um, conversation, uh, and it really touched on a lot of the the reasons why he left. I think um, mm. he, he was just really fed up with a lot of the um, the like so called liberty community, and a lot of our show um, prior to that point was you know centered around the ideas of liberty. But he really felt frustrated, I think, because he saw a lot of people around him who were here for the Free State Project here in New Hampshire. And hadn't, Mm. and hadn't been putting those ideas into practice in their lives. Um, and to me, that was always sort of kind of like some of the point behind why we did the show pork therapy, but, um, he, he was really frustrated because he saw it just continuing to, to take place. And so, so he left and wanted to just kind of, uh, I guess, retreat from, from being public and sort of be a little Mm -hmm. bit more private. And, uh, and that was cool. I, I hope he's, you know, I, like I wished him luck and everything. Um, I still wanted to keep doing a public show and definitely when he left, I reevaluated, um, what I wanted in terms of what I wanted to get out of doing the show. And what Mm -hmm. I wanted was to connect with people, you know, to meet, um, to meet friends and, and to connect, I don't know, get in touch with people who, shared my values and ideas. Um, I wanted to provide people with entertainment. I wanted to have something that eventually I could use to support myself if I wanted to and have it be really fun, you know, Mm. and, uh, I wanted to explore different ideas, you know, to learn, to continue to learn more, to challenge ideas that I held, to pick up new things and share them with the world. Um, and 
And I guess I probably also, you know, most podcasters won't admit this, but you have to have a certain component of it if you're going to be public and you're going to be in broadcasting. I I wanted people to listen to me, you know, (laughs) of course. (laughs) And there's nothing wrong with that. (laughs) Sure. I think a lot of people do want that, you know, and if, of course, if you're proud of your ideas, then you want to share them. And, um, you know, at, at, in the first early days of the podcast, I wasn't as proud of what I was putting out there. And so I was less, um, enthusiastic about promoting it and so forth, you know, right, right. but now I, you know, I use my full name, I promote the show and I have no problem because I feel a lot prouder of, of what I've done with it. Um, and so, but you had to, you know, I had to sort of get to that point and, we, you and I, Hannah, were just talking before we started recording this about, um, like about like how to podcast, basically, how do you, Mm -hmm. how do you start your own podcast? If that's something you're interested in and there's no one way, there are lots of different ways, but definitely nowadays there are so many more resources out there on the internet. Um, you know, more than like three years later after we started pork therapy, um, there are so many more resources out there that tell, tell you how to set up a podcast and how to promote it and how to, um, do the technical aspects at the time. There wasn't much that we could find. And so we figured out a lot of it on our own and it showed. (laughs) So I think we could have been a little faster with the learning curve, but one thing that I always did do from the beginning was listen back to every show that we made. Mm -hmm. And I was really, um, I was really interested in picking out things that I could practice about my style or the content or the audio quality or whatever, and trying to improve them. And I always had that attitude and I still do. I still listen to everything I produce, uh, whether it's an interview with somebody else, I'm going to listen back to this, uh, or it's one of my own shows or it's free talk live or anything else, because I also am a weekly co-host of the, the radio and uh, podcast show free talk live. <laughs> so I think listening back to to your own work or reevaluating your own work later can really be very um, fruitful if you approach it with an open mind. And yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. If you if you're kind of compassionate with yourself rather than uh, self critical, because I I mean what you're saying really resonates with me because I I have a real problem doing that. Like someone actually emailed me earlier today saying, "Hey, do you know when you're the the latest podcast I released is in stereo, not mono?" Uh-huh. And I would totally have known that if I mean I I sort of clicked play to check that it had worked when I'd uploaded it and everything. But if I'd actually plugged a pair of headphones in and listened to it all the way through, I would have gotten that pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. And Part of it for me is every time I hear myself, I'm still in that stage at the moment where I think, oh my goodness, is that what I sound like? <laughs> so, but you know, Hannah, so I, I definitely have that kind of a little bit of, you know, that self-criticism coming in there. So I think it's a really, I, I, I definitely um, agree with that advice that the, it's the only way to learn, I think, is by, or one of the best ways of learning anyway, the quickest way is to uh to sort of look back on everything you've done with a compassionate and empathic view. Yes, yes, definitely. And how think about how vulnerable you have to be to be willing to go through that learning curve publicly. Yeah. You know, to put, oh, yeah. to put the material out there, you know, uh, as soon as you release it and to let everybody hear the things that you may th- may think of later as mistakes or things that you would have liked to improve, but you put it out there and you, you know, share it with the world anyway. And I think that's yeah. very brave, very brave. Yeah. I think you have to have a certain level of resilience, don't you? And that's, mm. that's one thing I really admire hearing what you were saying about the beginning of your podcast. Um, because it sounds like you literally just went for it. And <laughs> yeah. although you were saying, um, that, you know, the quality and the content wasn't as good as you would have maybe liked hearing it now, three years later, it reminds me of that quote. I don't know who it's by, but it's, it, it goes something like, you know, all professionals start as amateurs. Yeah. So everyone, even, you know, people who are sort of at the top of their field started out as an amateur at some point. Mm-hmm. And it's just a question of, getting past that stage and getting to a point where you, you know, you can, you can take constructive criticism. You can be constructive with yourself about kind of looking back at past work that you've done and saying, okay, where can I better this without beating yourself up about it? And, um, you know, you have that level of resilience as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. And, uh, I wanted to mention on the air, I I told you this in person before we started to record, but I wanted to say that I heard your podcast about procrastination and I just thought that was so wonderfully, um, 
embodying this this attitude that we're talking about right now. Just it was very vulnerable, very open. But you know, you were not beating yourself up over it. You were just mm-hmm. looking at what happened with sort of a curious and critical, um, not self-critical, but just just a curious uh, lens. And you were taking away from it uh, some some things that you learned. I could tell and. Mm-hmm also helping you know share what was going on for you with the audience and i i really think that's the best way to sort of make a connection with your listeners is to be really uh really genuine with them like you were so that was cool well thank you so much for saying that i really i really appreciate it and um like i said to you earlier as well i i sort of doubly appreciate the feedback because it yeah it does feel like quite a big risk being i guess authentic with um Mm -hmm with you know readers or with listeners um etc because it is quite a risk because you're you're saying to people hi this is who i really am you know this is some of the stuff that goes on for me and um i think quite often i mean part of the reason that i want to do that is i i know that um for me um i've i've sort of had this uh thought pattern before where i felt like the only one who has felt xyz or the only one Mm. who's gone through this experience the only one who's like you know and it's a really isolating feeling and what i've come to learn is that so many of our experiences are just shared universally by everyone and it's so helpful and it's such a relief to realize that you're not the only one oh yeah i think you have a wonderful way of communicating uh that people can relate to you on. Uh, I don't know if it made sense the way I just said that, but I think your listeners will really be able to relate to you because I definitely felt that way when I was listening to your most recent show and also the other ones too. So, uh, so thank you for that and, and for being willing to put yourself out there. Cause I know that you consider yourself, um, an introvert or an introverted person. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so it must be sort of an extra challenge for you, but at the same time, there are reasons why a person who considers themselves an introvert would want to do a podcast because there are just so many benefits that you get from it. Even if you might have to overcome a little bit of shyness or, um, or fear, you know? Yeah, it's kind of cheating as well, because in the beginning anyway, if you're not doing interviews, you don't actually have to talk to anyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're just talking to a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great way to start off, you know, being able to sort of edit yourself. The first couple episodes of Pork Therapy, I mean, well, actually the first like several dozen episodes of Pork Therapy, we didn't edit at all. You know, we, we just, wow. we didn't even have a theme song to begin with. We just started talking into a mic and then we hit, you know, stop when we stopped recording. And, um, you know, then over time we added theme song, we up- upgraded our microphone, we did, we started to do editing and then the show began mm-hmm. to take shape a little bit more. And I started trying to improve the content and from my perspective and, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, a lot of podcasts, uh, change especially if it's somebody's first podcast, you know, if they're, Mm. if they are starting out as a true amateur and that's, what's so wonderful about podcasting is that like, you don't need a degree, you know, you can, if you have a computer, you can do it. (laughs) There are free websites where you can put your podcasts up. You can host them there for free. Um, you don't need to do heavy production in the beginning or, or really ever. Um, I mean, Stefan Molyneux has a very successful podcast, tons and tons of downloads. And I know he does video and stuff, but he doesn't have a theme song. He doesn't edit. You know, he really, it's really kind of no frills, but it works. No, in the first, I, I'm not even sure how many, like a couple of hundred podcasts I think he did from his car as well. So yeah, car casting. Doubly impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it is, I mean... I think there are people out there too who listen, who like to pick up on new podcasts or who like to kind of just listen to a large variety of stuff and they will find those sort of diamonds in the rough that end up becoming like huge, huge shows and just really blowing up. Um, and then, Mm. you know, this starting off, it's a person in their car. (laughs) So, um, So that is kind of cool to see. I think podcasting itself is an art form that really has very few barriers to to entry. And I like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a real opportunity, I think, for people to express themselves, share their ideas and, you know, hopefully kind of pass them on to other people as well. And what I really like about it, too, is that, as you said, it's a really low barrier to entry. So 
the the sort of listeners decide which podcasts mm-hmm. work out and which don't. I mean, obviously, there, there is a lot on the part of the person doing the podcasting in terms of the resilience that I was talking about earlier. But, um, you know, if people like it, they'll leave comments, they'll rate it, they'll share it with their friends. And if they don't, they won't. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, it's like the fairest rating system. Yeah, it's really the market uh, speaking uh, in the in the true like libertarian sense, <laughs> and absolutely, and it's so free form too. You know, because you can have a podcast with commercials or without commercials. You can have a podcast with breaks or without breaks. You can have music or no music. You can have uh, you can swear or not swear. You can do whatever you want with it, really. And everything is out there on the spectrum. I mean, there are just so many things you can do in podcasting that you can't do with a traditional radio format. Um, um, you yeah. can even live stream a podcast on the internet, so it it can have that feel of a live show. You can do a group Skype call where you do a podcast of that. So there are lots of ways to engage with your listeners, and really the sky's the limit. You can put as much in, work into it as you as you want. I mean, I know somebody who do, who is an experienced podcaster who has you know a lot of production on his show, a lot of like uh, music beds and sound effects and um, clips and things like that. Uh, puts the podcast out in stereo, you know, because he's a fidelity queen, as so called, so <laughs> self described, um, and spends hours editing each show, probably seven to twelve hours or something like that. But mm. you know, is really, really, really satisfied with the finished product. And some listeners just love that, like they have to have a podcast that's really high quality. And then there's, you know, there are the people who do the car cast and just slap it up on the internet and put it out there. And uh, and not to say that that's low quality either, you know, because what they could be saying is gold. And in some cases mm. it is. Um, but it's just, I love that there's such a wide range in podcasting. And, oh, by the way, I have to plug this. Um, I, <laughs> at Pork... Porkfest, where you and I were both at, Hannah, and we did a yep. we did a little bit of a, our own show from there. You were on Pork Therapy, which was which I really liked. Um, yeah, that was fun. That was fun for me too. I it felt like it felt like five minutes went by, but it was really like thirty minutes that we were talking, <laughs> which was uh, really cool. But at Porkfest, also, I was part of a podcasting panel, which you can find. Um, you know, rebroadcast on my website, porktherapy.com. It's one of the um, bonus podcast only shows. And it's a podcast about podcasting. It's about how to start your own show. So if you're interested in that, um, it might be a good resource to check out. And of course, there are tons of other resources online about how to do that. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, just going back to something that you were talking about earlier, I would highly recommend checking out the podcasting panel, by the way, because I've, I've heard it and it's, it's really, really useful and very inspiring to um, but just to go back to something you were talking about earlier, one thing I really enjoy about pork therapy is that I started listening to it just as Mike left mm-hmm. um, last year. And I really like the fact that you've made it your own. And I was thinking as you were talking about sort of him leaving and everything, how what really fascinated me about what you're saying was that it's almost like by him being sort of authentic and following his gut feelings about um, sort of changes within himself and how he felt about the, the some of the, the people in the Free State Project and some of the Liberty Movement, etc., that also allowed you to be more authentic and to take the show in a direction that you felt a little comfortable with as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it absolutely did. And today I'm, I'm very happy with it. You know, I, I definitely still want to keep improving and keep adding things and changing things. And, uh, you know, the name is one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately, uh, because over time my views have shifted a lot on sort of self-defense and, and violence and things like that. And I know that libertarians use a porcupine as their mascot. And at the, at the time when we started the show, you know, we thought that was a cute mascot and, and, you know, Mm. that was great. But, you know, the more I think about it now, it has this, it does have this sort of message of, you know, don't tread on me, don't mess with me. Uh, and, Mm. And the quills are a little intimidating. And I don't know if that's the message I want to portray. But of course, it's really hard once you've established a brand and you've had the name out there, uh, it's it's difficult to change that, you know, to get people mm-hmm. to switch the feed or anything like that. So if I do change the name, I'll make it as seamless as possible. Um, but that is something I've been playing around with. Also, people mistake it. You know, people believe that I'm a therapist, which I'm not. Um, so I don't know if that was a good choice to name it Pork Therapy. Uh, it was just sort of something that we wanted to convey was that the show was about 
is about personal issues and it's about relationships and freedom. And how do you, how do you think of a name that combines all those things? And I love the voluntary life, but somebody's already taken it. And I love becoming who you are, (laughs) but somebody's already taken that too. Yeah. (laughs) Um, but yeah, what I really like about what you're saying though is like, I completely understand that, you know, there is that real dilemma of, you know, once you've started something and you have that brand, I'm just like, oh, should I change it? Cause it feels right to change it. But at the same time, what about sort of, you know, essentially business sense mm-hmm. and what if, you know, the new brand is not as compelling as the old one and so on. But, um, again, I like, it really reminds me about you know, there's that group of people who really want to start a project of their own and really want to start a business and they spend forever in the planning stage mm-hmm. and they get everything absolutely perfect. So they, you know, drop a whole load of money on a designer and they get a website done and they get a logo done and they mm-hmm. have, you know, like a, a style guide and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but they haven't actually done anything yet. Yep. And I think it's really easy to get caught up in the making everything perfect stage yeah, and mm-hmm. not to ever, and, and that kind of being almost like a cover for actually having to take the risk of putting stuff out there. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, a, a lot of people out there are like me and get overwhelmed by large, what they see as large projects, you know, that. Yeah, that are that involve a lot of steps or a lot of work. And so you are you're absolutely right on the money that if you maybe breaking it down into smaller pieces is a little easier to handle or not pressuring yourself to do everything all at once and letting it letting it grow and evolve as time goes on. Yeah. And I think port therapy just goes to show as well, that even though you're not sort of super happy with the branding right now, the show is still incredibly popular and it's still really successful. So to me, that kind of shows that even if it's not, you know, if you you look back three years later and you're not completely happy with it, it still works. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I've, you know, I think I've served my, a lot of my original goals, which are, um, you know, connecting with people. I've met some really actually good friends, including you, Hannah, through the show. And, yeah. Uh, well, and I'm really glad you did the show because otherwise I probably wouldn't have met you. Yeah, exactly. And uh, wow, I'm so glad that that you're in my life. And, you know, my partner, Brian, I actually met him through the show, too. And it's great. So that that has definitely been, you know, satisfying me or or meeting my needs or getting me some of the things that I set out to 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 get when I uh, started the show. Um, Not Mm -hmm. that I was trying to, you know, meet partners through the show, but I wanted to connect. That was basically it. And, uh, yeah. and there's something about being visible as well. So if you take that risk and you really put yourself out there and you say, you know, hello world, this is who I am and this is what I believe. And, mm-hmm. um, it, these are sort of the, the values that I have and so on and so forth. Then, you know, you're, you're actually, although it's scary and it's a huge risk, you're actually opening up a lot of opportunities for yourself as well. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And it, pay, you know, it's so nice when I hear from somebody And for everybody who writes to me, there are probably lots of people who don't write to me, but it's so nice when I hear from somebody who says, Hey, I really enjoy your show. Ever since I started listening to it, I've thought about some things in my own life or made some changes, or I just really like what you have to say. And I feel, you know, I feel happier from thinking about some of these things or whatever. That Mm -hmm. definitely means a lot to me. And it really, it, it really has fulfilled, um, a desire that I have to, I don't know, to, to help people out, to like give something to people. I don't know, just in, in a general sense. Um, so I like that. And I've been really pleased with the, you know, the feedback I've gotten, especially now that I have this, um, when Mike left, I, I built a studio for pork therapy. Mm-hmm. Before that, we were recording onto a USB microphone. We didn't have a mixing board and we'd have to do a lot of volume leveling and playing with the audio to get it just right. But after that, I built a, a studio for myself. I had to learn a lot of technical aspects to be able to do that. I also built the, you know, redesigned the website. So I had to learn some web design to be able to do that. Um, not to say it's completely advanced, but it's it works. And I got a lot of compliments on the audio quality and, um, and the website and and so forth. So I've learned some new skills and I think people are, are listening because I get, you know, downloads and I'm really happy about that. Great. 
that's awesome to hear because I, I mean, I, yeah, I love the show and I, I agree with um, what you were saying about listener feedback earlier that it's also really made me think about a lot of things in my own life and a lot of my own beliefs and judgments and really rethink them mm -hmm. as well. And I, I definitely think my personal development has deepened as a result of listening to pork therapy. It's incredibly thought provoking today. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. That really means a lot, especially coming from you, who is the, I consider somewhat of a personal development uh, expert or savvy person. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I'm not sure about expert. I don't know if you can be an expert because the I journey know. is so different for everyone, but I really appreciate the feedback. <laughs> you, you definitely, um, I would say you, you have explored these topics more than your average bear. So <laughs> I appreciate what you said. And I, I love your blog too. And I hope you continue in podcasting because it is so much fun. And I think I've really enjoyed the ones that you've put out so far. And hopefully you get some ideas from, you know, from this conversation and, and other ones too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm really glad that I'm sort of branching out and doing interviews now as well. It's very exciting and yes. it opens up a lot of possibilities too in terms of content and who I can talk to and so on and so forth. So yeah, the yeah. future is exciting. <laughs> Definitely. One thing I did want to ask you, just talking about um, personal development, um, is because Pork Therapy is a show about relationships, right? And you, you cover a lot of very personal content. Mm -hmm. And um, something that I'm really struck by when I listen to the show is that you you cover a lot of personal content and a lot of content about relationships, but you're also incredibly boundaried about your own sort of personal life <laughs> and, um, and everything. And I, I mean, I can completely understand why, because obviously there's putting your ideas out there and then, you know, it's, it's a really delicate balance between sharing enough of yourself, mm. but not sharing too much so that you feel uncomfortable and you feel really exposed afterwards. Yes. And so how, one thing that I wanted to ask you is how do you set boundaries around protecting your privacy while also being very authentic on the show as well? That's, yeah, that's a really interesting question that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and maybe still working it out a little bit. Um, one thing that I I feel concerned about is that, you know, I've, I've listened to a lot of people who do advice columns or advice shows, you know, and they, that's their label for themselves. They, they call themselves mm -hmm. advice people. And what they say is that don't, you don't talk about yourself. Nobody ever wants to hear someone who's giving advice, talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And I took that to heart, you know, um, as much as possible early on and, you know, fought the urge to say, well, this happened to me and this is what I did. Um, and I was glad for that. Because, uh, you know, when you, when you put yourself out there, when you're public, there are going to be some people who don't really have a sense of boundaries or maybe don't, mm. don't feel the same way about the, about boundaries that you do and mm. are going to go a little too far and maybe assume things like that you want to be hit on or that you want to get pictures of them or that, you know, you want to meet them or something like that, or that you want to right. get an email from them every day, which, you know, you don't necessarily want. Uh, so, <laughs> and I know you've had experience working at a stalking helpline. So, you know, mm. you, you know a lot about this, Hannah, um, mm. hopefully not from personal experience, but you know, you, you've seen other people go through it. Um, and, yeah. and yeah, um, it, it is a fear whenever you're public, you know, especially if you are sort of an introverted person, those thoughts really creep up on you and, and you say, okay, well, I don't want to, I don't want someone to hear this and think that I'm inviting them to, to do something that I don't want, like hit on me or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm very conscious of that. Um, at the same time, I think that there are some ways in which you can really connect with the listeners by sharing your personal experiences. So for mm. instance, um, a couple weeks ago on pork therapy, I was reading an article about obesity and how it's linked with, uh, abuse, it, you know, child abuse and, and spanking yeah. and things like that. And I did, you know, I do share this on the show that I, I am a formerly obese person, you know, that I was obese as a child and that I, uh, you know, I broke free from it. And for the past more than 10 years, I've been normal weight, which is, which I'm really proud of. So yeah. being proud of it, um, is one reason to share it, but also because maybe if people hear that, um, they can, 
uh, they can know that they're not alone, you know, uh, and they can yeah. know that, hey, this person that I feel like I know pretty well that I listen to on the radio on a weekly basis, this person shares something in common with me. And if she can do this, if she can learn about nutrition or whatever and, and free herself from a body that she didn't like, then maybe I can do it too. And so I sort of do some of it for that reason. Another thing is, is coming out of the closet, and I think that there are lots of things, not just being gay or bisexual or transgendered or anything like that, but, you know, something like coming out of the closet as an atheist, because mm. it's, it's anything in society that there is a lot of stigma or shame around and that people are scared to admit that they uh, are a member of some group because they they fear that they will be uh, persecuted. And that has a chilling effect on other people admitting that, mm. hey, I'm a part of this group too. So I, I really am a big believer in coming out of the closet about about being not straight. Um, I, personally, I, I identify as bisexual and I'm open about that because I, I want other people who are bi or gay or anything or just straight allies to know that they're not uh, alone and that other people, you know, other people are not straight too. <laughs> and that they're, yeah. they don't have to feel weird. Cause I definitely felt weird about it for much of my life. I, I thought there was something wrong with me that I was, you know, there was a part of me that was attracted to women, women. Mm. And I always stuffed that down and suppressed it and thought it was wrong, but, um, it's not, it's absolutely not. And I want other people to know that too. And to share my, uh, experience and my, um, uh, my, I guess, knowledge and having gone through that with other people. And also, yeah. also, I, re- of- I, I just want to say, I really admire that in particular about that particular topic, because, um, I think it is such a common experience, mm. um, because it's an unfortunate fact that in our society, that's, you know, UK society and US society, and I'm sure most places in the world, there is still a lot of stigma associated with being either gay or bisexual mm-hmm. or, you know, any, any other kind of sexuality that deviates from the traditional heterosexual, uh, norm and I, I you know I, I don't use the word normal with any kind of judgment attached there just as a descriptive word mm-hmm. but um I I think it is such a common experience and I think you know it it's really admirable that you're kind of sharing your experience around that and kind of taking that risk and doing that Thank you. Thank you so much. I I really appreciate that. And I I have to say, at least for the people who listen to my show, maybe the people who don't like uh, queerness don't listen to my show, but I've had nothing but really like supportive stuff. I mean, a couple people have, have said have creeped and said stuff like, you know, you want to have a threesome with me or whatever, my girlfriend or, uh, but nobody really, uh, has really done anything too, uh, too bad or, you know, that I didn't like too much or nobody has really been hateful about it. Like that I'm going to hell and I'm a sinner and so forth. And so, Mm. um, so that's cool. And I, you know, I want, I think it is, the reason I talk about being bi in particular is because I think there is a lot of untapped bi-ness out there, uh, for lack of a better phrase, (laughs) (laughs) that more people, um, more people are slightly toward the middle of the Kinsey scale than think that they are or know that Mm. they are, or will admit that they are. And, Mm. (laughs) and I want them to let that part of themselves be free to express itself because for me, it wasn't for a long time and it was extremely confining. So if there's an easy way to get a lot of people to uh, feel more free in their own lives, yeah, let's, let's do it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's part of who people are. I mean, that's that's not something that you can erase or you can change. Mm-hmm. It's your sexuality. And the more that people talk about it, the more free people will be. So the more free people will feel to be who they really are in that sense. And to, you yes. know, be comfortable with that and be accepting of that in themselves as well. Yes, absolutely. And uh, maybe there is a little bit of a, a secret motivation that, you know, there's some woman listening to my show who has a crush on me or something like that, but <laughs> mostly it's just for visibility, you know, it's just, just, to, <laughs> just to show that there are people out there who, who don't necessarily fit the mold. And, you know, I think everybody can relate to coming out too, because even if they're not gay or bi or trans or whatever, um, or queer in some way, I don't want to leave anybody out. <laughs> I never know how to really say that acronym, but even if they, if they're sec- they're oriented is straight. Um, everybody can relate to this because who hasn't felt like they were different at some time? 
Yeah, I think that's a really great point. There's different types of coming out. Yeah, absolutely. And it's no accident (laughs) that atheists often use that phrase of coming out as an atheist because... Wow, for some people, coming out as an atheist to their family, to their you know religious family, is just as scary and carries just as high of a potential for persecution or stigma as it does mm-hmm. to, to say that you're gay, uh, even if they're perfectly straight. You know, they're, coming out as an atheist can be really tough, or coming mm-hmm. out as a as an anarchist or somebody who doesn't you know a, support a large government or anything like that, a libertarian, um, mm-hmm. a voluntarist. All of that can be very difficult, especially when you're surrounded by people and you just don't think that there's anybody else who you can relate to on in those ways. Um, mm. So I've, I've heard of similar experiences of people who do unschooling, which is a type of homeschooling where you oh. don't have a defined curriculum, but yeah. you, you sort of pursue what the children are naturally interested in, mm-hmm. um, which to me makes a lot of sense. But I've heard of people who've pursued that, who have come under a huge barrage of criticism and ostracism from the people around them who've, you know, levied all kinds of accusations at them and just, you know, it's really triggered something in the people around them that's meant that they faced a huge amount of hostility for essentially, you know, coming out as unschoolers. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And <laughs> anytime you deviate from the mold, I think you do sort of get the those reactions from people, yeah. especially people who haven't ever allowed themselves permission to deviate from the mold, you know, yeah. but at the same time, people's stereotypes and judgments are only going to be broken down a lot of times by knowing somebody who is different than them and doesn't fit those stereotypes or, or they're a good person. And well, you know, I, I used to not like gay people, but then my son was gay and I decided I liked them or, you know, there's a lot of people like that. Yeah. Or hearing a podcast, for example. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Cause there was a guy, um, uh, I, we're recording this on a Sunday and, uh, it's Sunday, let's see, July 22nd. And, uh, I'm about to go down to Keene, New Hampshire for Free Talk Live, which is the other show that I do on the weekends. And there was a guy who called in this week on Free Talk Live and said that he thinks that the Sunday show, uh, which I host with Mark, is, um, you know, that I'm hijacking the Sunday show with my gay agenda. And uh, 80% of the content is about gay issues. And (laughs) I think that that's, that's not true. But what I was thinking in response to that was that if I have any agenda, it's to just welcome more people in, you know, <laughs> yeah. to be more. Yeah. The, only, the only agenda is encouraging people to be their real selves. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So if that's my agenda, then fine, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of a shame because I guess, you know, you could also say perhaps his agenda is to unfortunately perhaps stifle those aspects in other people that he doesn't feel very comfortable with himself. Oh, he doesn't want to hear about those queers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's, it's really, I mean, it's really interesting. Cause like just going back to the whole boundaries thing, mm-hmm. I can really see the value in talking about, um, things like sexuality and, you know, you mentioned, um, the fact that you're obese as a child as well. And I, I just think that is, is such an admirable, admirable thing to do and it's so important as well because there are a lot of people who are dealing with similar things in their own lives who might feel completely isolated and hearing someone else talk about it might be the only time that they hear someone accepting it and yes you know that not to put not to sort of over dramatize or anything but that's a lifeline for a lot of people hearing Mm. someone else having a similar experience and thinking oh phew you know that's okay Mm-hmm. Like it's not just me. And it's a real, it's a really tricky balance, I think, isn't it? Between doing that and kind of opening up as much as you feel comfortable with to share that with people, but mm-hmm. then also having those boundaries at the same time. So you're yes. not sharing to, it's a kind of self-protection thing. Mm-hmm. And it really makes me think of um, something that we've talked about quite a few times before, which is sort of empathy and compassion starting at home. Mm -hmm. So you have to feel empathy and compassion for yourself and respect your own boundaries before you can really sort of share stuff about yourself with other people that's going to be helpful to them. Mm. And, you know, before you can be compassionate and empathic with them as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't have said it better. And it, it does feel, I guess it, it does feel good. It, it feels good to be authentic, of course, but it does mm. feel good sometimes to share things that seem a little bit risky uh, with yeah. an audience because it's like, I don't have to feel ashamed of this. I don't have to hide this. You know, this is, this really genuinely is okay. And I'm fine with, with sharing it with you. So, um, yeah, that can definitely feel very liberating and exciting. Yeah. At times. And I guess I'm, I'm aware that sort of the authenticity in doing something that is in public, part of that is knowing where your boundaries are. So mm. It's authentic to want to share some things and it's perfectly authentic to say, no, that's where my limit is. And I'm not comfortable, you yeah. know, sharing X, Y, Z that's happened to me or that I've experienced in my life. Yeah. And that that's really being authentic. Cause I think if, if people sort of feel pressured to either not say anything about this, it's the whole should thing, right? It's like, Oh, I shouldn't say anything about myself at all. Mm -hmm. I should tell people everything that's going on in my life at the moment and just splurge. I think that's, to me, that's not authentic because you're not respecting your own boundaries and your own needs for privacy then either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. D you know, I've heard both. I mean, from other broadcasters, I've heard people that I feel a little uncomfortable listening to them because they are so open about their own um, personal lives and what's going on mm -hmm. with them. And sometimes it almost doesn't even seem relevant to the content of what they're talking about. It's just like, listen to me, you know. And then I've heard people who... I wish they would be a little more open and vulnerable and that mm -hmm. they would share a little bit more with the audience because I'm curious about, about them. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I guess it's a personal preference or it's a matter of, of aesthetics, but, um, yeah, I think we all have to sort of strike that balance and not just for podcasters, but it's sort of like also, you know, how are you going to, how are you going inter to interact with people at work or certain friends, you know, who's in your yeah. inner, inner circle and who's in your secondary circle or, or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a really great point. And just taking it sort of to a wider scale, I think it just when in any situation where you are relating to other people that could be at work with friends, with acquaintances, you know, even with like partners or spouses or siblings or family members, you know, knowing where your limits are and knowing sort of how safe you feel to share certain aspects of yourself is so important because mm. that's the difference between you being visible and feeling completely exposed, which is not a nice place to be. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It, it should be liberating, not, not scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, th I mean, I think there is a, a sense of, kind a of risk scary. associated with being visible, but, um, it's, I mean, I've definitely experienced both. I've experienced kind of being visible and I've experienced situations where I've shared some stuff with, you know, certain people. And afterwards I thought, you know what, that was a really bad plan. Mm. Like I, I really sort of regret that now. Yeah. And that's been a really, I mean, it's been a really helpful experience for me because it's kind of made me go back and think, okay, well, why did I do that at that point? And how can I sort of learn from this in the future? But at the same time, it's a horrible place to be. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you can always say more, but you can never take back something that you've said on the radio. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, and, and there have been times too, as a broadcaster where my opinion on something significant has changed you know, and then I have to go back and, and explore that a little bit and, and explain it. And I think people are, are always open to hearing when somebody has a change of heart, you know, or a change of opinion, mm -hmm. uh, especially when they've, you know, it's rational, they've considered the facts and they've just come to a different conclusion than they used to. Um, I think that's, that can be really interesting to hear about why somebody changes their mind on something. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's a really brave thing to admit that you've changed your mind as well. Because quite often, I think, I mean, I, I know certainly when I've been in situations just with friends and I've changed my opinion about something, I felt a bit nervous about saying that because mm. I've sort of expected them to turn around and say, well, you said this, you know, sort of a year ago or whatever. And, yeah. Yeah. They um, might, they may not even remember though. I mean, that voice oftentimes come from, comes from within ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact is that we are always changing. Yeah. You know, the sort of the this whole living thing is a complete process. You know, <laughs> we're just from day to day we're always kind of shifting and changing and our thoughts and opinions about things are shifting and changing because we're always getting new information. It's it's we're always in process. So it makes sense that, you know, I'm I'm always very kind of um wary when people sort of don't change. Mm-hmm. 
because I, I just wonder whether there's part of them which is resisting that, you know. Yeah, or is there any growth? Would they be open to growing, you know, because yeah. growth sort of comes with change or change comes with growth. Like, they're kind of tied together, you know. And so you wonder if, if something never changes, um, is that person open open to things that could help them grow, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, have we have we covered it all? This was like, this is a really cool talk. We really got to the heart of authenticity. Yeah, really, I've really enjoyed it. I really appreciate the fact that we've sort of covered uh, more practical aspects to do with kind of podcasting and stuff like that. And you're, the projects that you're working on at the moment, I put therapy and we've also delved into some really meaty emotional topics too. So I really like the balance there. Me too, Hannah. Yeah. It's always an interesting conversation when you and I get together. <laughs> I like, yeah, this is interesting to me. Hours, couldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I am aware though that you've got to dash off and do free talk live. So, um, I would love to talk to you again at some point soon and have you back on to talk a little bit more about some of the things that you mentioned tonight. Yeah. Thank you for that. Me too. I would like to talk more about this and also about, uh, sort of self-employment. You know, we uh, had discussed yeah. that. I'll, I'll figure that out with you afterwards, but, uh, I, but yeah, more, more chats to come. <laughs> definitely well thank you so much for coming on the show and um if you want to check out stephanie's website it's www.porktherapy.com you can also find the podcast in itunes and yeah check it out i highly highly recommend it it's one of my favorite podcasts i've been listening for about nine months now and i I love every episode i always get i always learn something new i always get something more out of it so go and check it out porktherapy.com that's Talk with a C. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hannah. That's really nice. And I, I highly recommend, this is going to go on my feed too. So I want to recommend um, Hannah's blog and, and her podcast, which is, um, you know, a podcast is, is developing, and, but she's got a lot of content that's sort of in the written style too, as well as her sentence completion course, which I recently did and cannot recommend that highly enough. I mean, if you can get, get the activation energy to do something like a little bit of, you know, 10 minutes of introspection every day, uh, then you are going to get so much out of it. So I really recommend um, checking out Hannah's sentence completion course. Thanks for the recommendation. <laughs> and I, I, I definitely agree with that. I think there's no, no investment quite like investment in yourself. Mm-hmm. So yeah, but thank you for the, thank you for the recommendation. My pleasure. And thanks for making all that content. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. That was my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Great. Great. Well, I look forward to talking to you again soon. I do too. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thanks so much once again to Stephanie for coming on the show. Don't forget to check out her website at porktherapy.com and remember that it's pork with a C, not a K. If you'd like to find out more about Becoming Who You Are or you have any questions, comments or suggestions about the podcast, please go to becomingwhoyouare.net and feel free to take a look around or get in touch. I look forward to talking to you again very soon.